we've begun the Cantabrian, but now let's, let's go to Andre Jasper, who's going to talk about wildfire in Gondwana in the, in the late Pennsylvania. Andre, it's your talk. Okay, hi. Thank you, Lucas, and thank you all the organization for, uh, for the invitation to, to speak a little bit about uh, Gondwana and uh, wildfires. Uh, I, I have to confess before I, I, I start that uh, the late uh, the, the Carboniferous, uh, I'm not really uh, familiar with the Carboniferous uh, because our deposits in Western Gondwana, they are most related related to the Permian, and the Carboniferous started to be interesting and important for us uh, since the last five years, when uh, exactly uh, Neil Griffins and uh, Isabel Montañez, etc., uh, when they made some uh, absolute dating, uh, and all the strata we were uh, working with. Uh, they slopped down, uh, also in the Permian. So uh, at the beginning, when I started with paleobotany here, uh, I was thinking, I was working with uh, with, a, with a Congorian and Artinskian, and now we know we are working with a Salian uh, and uh, probably uh, with a few uh, um, Carboniferous strata. Uh, another thing is that I probably uh, should have uh, change the title of this uh, speech uh, to a question uh, because uh, okay uh, we we also have new insights uh, on the on the uh, new uh, on the new data from Gondwana. Uh, okay, uh, I am I am uh, Andre Jasper and I'm working in Brazil, uh, but I'm just representing uh, a working group. Uh, which also integrates uh, Dieter Hull, Haisam El Afti. Dieter Hull is from Germany, Haisam from Egypt, and uh, another Etienne, which is uh, a researcher from uh, northern Brazil. Uh, so, and, and okay, I, I'm just here to show what we are doing. Uh, and next, please. And okay, uh, it could, it can look a little bit basic, but uh, it's necessary to start uh, when we are talking about fire. Uh, it's, ne it's necessary to uh, start with the basics. Uh, and uh, that you can have fire, it's necessary three things, or it's three details. You need uh, ignition source, you need fuel, and you need oxygen. So uh, the the this is the necessary things. They, they are the necessary things uh, so that we can have wildfires and paleo wildfires. Uh, and uh, sorry, this, this uh, picture is also in German and Portuguese, but they are the original pictures, uh, illustrations. And uh, nowadays we have 21% of oxygen in the atmosphere uh, and the lower, uh, lower, uh, needs of oxygen that we can have fire is around 15%. It means that when atmosphere doesn't have at least at, le at least 15% uh, of oxygen, we, the fire will not really occur. So uh, all the time we have fire we and records of fire, we really can confirm that we have at least 15% of oxygen. Uh, and of course, the fuel, it's a, we can consider as biomass. Uh, and uh, the ignition sources are really of different kinds, uh, lightning, uh, volcanism, and so on. Uh, and uh, also natural and uh, spontaneous ignition can occur uh, as a, a source of, of ignition. Next, please. Uh, if we consider nowadays, uh, fire is present everywhere. And uh, recently, yes, Brazil was really famous about the burning of Amazon. Uh, and uh, this is, this is uh, there are two maps uh, of 
satellite uh, uh, images, uh, which show how much Earth is burning uh, each day. So we have the first one is March 31, 2020. Uh, then you can see that Amazon was really without fire. Yeah? Uh, and when we go to a uh, iconic day for us Brazilians, uh, the September 7, 7, which is our independence day, uh, then we really had the Amazon forest burning and another uh, environment and biome was burning at the same time here, which is the Pantanal, the Chaco uh, is this wetland, which is located at central east Brazil. Uh, and this same area with really uh, uh, dense areas of, of wetlands and swamps uh, was also burning. So it means that it, you can see the difference uh, from one time of the year and to the another. It's just an, one example. Uh, next, if we have a look on last week, this is uh, the mapping of uh, our uh, of the fire uh, from the world uh, at last Friday, uh, and you can see that we are starting burning now because the drier season uh, of uh, in Brazil is, is starting in. April, May, and then we start to burn really because the environments are really uh, without rain and uh, they are dry. So next. Uh, the point is, this is the Amazon in 2020 uh, and uh, we had really huge areas burning uh, and also, in the same way as in the uh, fossil record, uh, when you have a burning, you have uh, a, lot, a lot of uh, material, material coming out. Uh, and one of the materials that remains are charcoal or is charcoal, uh, which is formed from the wood that didn't completely burn out. So here uh, in this picture, uh, just to show you, this is the Amazonian forest and uh, right low, uh, it's, I, I made an arrow to point out the, the, the charcoal uh, accumulated after Amazonia was burned in uh, last year. Next, please. And this <laughs> is just to illustrate, but uh, it's from our uh, barbecue grill at home, uh, where we, we also use charcoal to make the, make the barbecue. And uh, I took these pictures last week. Uh, and this is how charcoal looks actually uh, nowadays. Uh, but it's quite the same as it looks uh, in the fossil record, uh, because this fragments, they are stable. They really do not degradate anymore. So it means they will, if, even if they, they are, uh, are transported, they are really resistant to degradation. So it means they are fossilized automatically. Uh, it's different as carbonification and we call it carbonization. Next, please. Uh, we uh, made experiment, a student of mine made experiment, uh, and it, it was just repeating uh, what uh, we had seen in other papers. Uh, but in 2012, uh, Osterkamp, a student of mine, uh, she submitted different, uh, sorry, uh, uh, submitted uh, pieces of wood, it's Araucaria wood in this case, because it's the most similar, it's a conifer, and we have it here in South Brazil. Uh, so we started with in natura pieces of wood, they are one per one centimeter, uh, and uh, started to uh, up uh, to, to uh, up the temperature in, in a muffler, uh, and then we took these pieces and observated in, uh, in the uh, 
scanning microscope. Uh, the, the first change you can see is that the natural in natural wood, it has a wood color. And when it goes to 250, uh, 300 degrees Celsius, it started to get black and reduce the size and uh, start to be fragmentary and so on. Uh, but the interesting thing is that also the cellular structures, uh, structures uh, they change. And if I, I'm not sure if it is really, uh, if you really can see it here, but uh, at 250 degrees, we still have the lamella media. This is, we don't have, uh, we have each cell separated and the lamella media, lamella media is, is still present. And when we reach around 300 and 350 degrees Celsius, uh, these cell walls, they homogenize. Uh, it means that cellulose and lignin, etc., it kind of melts and the lamella media disappears. So uh, it, it's the, the, this is coincident with the 300 and 350 50 degrees Celsius when uh, exactly the color also changes. Uh, so we consider in macro charcoal or in charcoal studies, uh, the homogenized, homogenized cell walls as a indicator of charcoal. Uh, if we still can observe some remain of uh, uh, the lamella media, uh, then we are not talking from charcoal or fire uh, in consequence. So this is uh, about really short about fire. It's just that you can have, have an uh, idea about how we identify the remains. Of course, we have indirect uh, indicators of paleo wildfires, the inertinites, uh, the polycyclic aromatic uh, uh, hydrocarbons, uh, but as direct indicator for paleo wildfires, we use the macro charcoal. Of course, in palynology, you also have uh, uh, charcoal present, uh, but uh, here we, we don't uh, submit uh, this material to any chemical or physical treatment. We just extract the, the, the pieces of the sediment uh, or of the coals, and then we act, be mounted, uh, prepare it for analysis. Uh, please, the next. Uh, if we consider Brazil, uh, Neil yesterday uh, uh, talked about, uh, about it. Uh, uh, we have the Gondwana, yeah, we are apart from the Gondwana uh, during Carboniferous and during the Permian. Uh, and in Brazil, we have two main basins that represent this late Paleozoic uh, uh, strata. And the nowadays accepted as Carboniferous uh, strata, uh, they are located mostly at the Bacia do Paraná, which is the southern uh, area uh, of Brazil, central southern, southern area of Brazil. Uh, and we are located at nearby Porto Alegre. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see it. It's, uh, it's the border, it's nearby the border with Uruguay. Uh, so the most part of the strata that uh, appear here, they are from the Permian, but uh, interesting things are appearing now with a new dating. Uh, next, please. If we take into account uh, our Paleofloras, macro paleofloras. Uh, I, I'm uh, now. I have to uh, make a, a parenthesis here uh, because uh, you are talking about the the, the Casimovian and uh, about your uh, your, <laughs> but the uh, late Pennsylvanian uh, paleofloras from the northern hemisphere. Uh, and the inter interesting thing that is that. Uh, I can see what happens here uh, during the Permian. Uh, it's uh, something really interesting because we have the Glossopteris for flora and we, we start with a dominance uh, of Brazilodendron, which is the lycopsid, the sub 
arborescent lycopsid we, uh, that dominates uh, a few uh, paleo uh, assemblages uh, in in Brazil and South America. Uh, also Bumodendrum and uh, uh, Cyclodendron in South Africa, uh, and Pseudobumodendrum and so on. Please the next. This is this is a, a, a um, artistic reconstruction of this kind of environment, and then uh, you can see that we are dominated by uh, the lycop seeds, uh, and they are growing exactly over uh, the, the the coal layers formed in the peat, means, uh, uh, and Glossopteris is growing a little bit far away, but uh, as we can observe here, we have this dominance of Brazilodendron lycopsids, subarborescent lycopsids, uh, before we have really the uh, explosion and the occupation of Glossopteris flora. So it, it, it is in discussion also that uh, we have uh, some uh, a Brazilodendron flora uh, occurring in Western, Western Gondwana uh, during these times. Please, the next. Uh, and looking at this Brazilodendron, uh, this is uh, uh, this Brazilodendron uh, flora. Uh, this is a locality that was also descri uh, uh, described and, and uh, absolutely dating, dated by uh, Griffiths, uh, Griffiths and uh, colleagues uh, in 2018. If I'm not wrong, this is, this is Kiteria outcrop, and. Uh, at the Kiteria outcrop, we have this Brazilodendron growing uh, exactly uh, in situ, uh, at, uh, like they they uh, grow the, during the Permian, and uh, uh, w with this macroflora that is preserved, there, which includes conifers and uh, this only one Glossopteris, uh, we found this little black fragments. Uh, pointed out here in these uh, red uh, arrows. Uh, it's, in this case, it is a clastic sediment, uh, and, uh, but immediately, immediately below, we have uh, a coal. It's not really a, a thick uh, uh, strata or this level of coal, but they are a few centimeters, centimeters and also there we can find these uh, charcoal fragments. Uh, next. Uh, and when we took a look on this material uh, under electronic microscope, uh, we, the first thing we were looking for, of course, we have another details pointed out here, but uh, uh, what you can see is that the cell walls are homogenized. It means they were submitted at temperatures at least at 350 degrees. Uh, it means fire. Yeah. Uh, and looking at all our uh, Paraná basin uh, outcrops, please the next. We could find, uh, uh, it was possible to find uh, charcoal in each single outcrop with coal, with coal layers, and also in a lot of outcrops without coal layers. Uh, it means that we had fire really reaching uh, all these uh, areas and all these uh, uh, paleofloras uh, in a high intensity. Please, the next, during the Permian. Okay. Yeah, and uh, during the Cesularian, uh, uh, it is it's also a work of uh, Sabin of Mai, uh, when we mapped all these occurrences uh, and compared it to, to inertinites, and uh, the macro charcoal is occurring really, uh, it's, we have macro charcoal in uh, South Africa, in uh, um, Southern Brazil, as I showed to you, and uh, all over the the uh, Gondwana. The next, please. That means that our environment 
composed composed by uh, uh, lycopsids and glossopteries and conifers and so on, uh, it was really burning uh, over the Permian, and uh, uh, we can change the rec rec reconstruction uh, and include uh, include uh, paleo wildfires uh, reaching all this vegetation. Uh, next, please. And why I'm talking here in the Kazimovia meeting is because uh, in the last five years, as I said, uh, a few uh, da absolute datings were made here uh, in in southern Brazil and uh, also in Gondwana at, at a wall. Uh, and uh, this special special this locality, which is it's, uh, I'm not sure if you can see it, but uh, the absolute dating was made uh, in the uh, in the uh, for uh, Rio Bonito formation, but uh, the as uh, making little little stratigraphic correlations, uh, the the geologists they established that the lower part of this outcrop was uh, related to, related to the Itarare from the group, uh, which means Carboniferous or Casimovia Moscolian. Uh, and there we found little fragments of charcoal. Uh, it means that uh, it was burning, this environment, it was burning uh, since the, the, uh, the late uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, next, please. And these are unpublished data. We have some carboniferous strata, strata in the Parnaiba Basin, which is at the north. And uh, we also had a look on this, on this, uh, on samples from there. Please the next. And uh, we are not sure yet, uh, but uh, we have uh, probably uh, charcoal also occurring in this area. The next, please. This is just. That you can have, you probably are not uh, seeing it directly, <laughs> uh, but it's uh, fire during the Permian. You will see a lot of occurrences there. Uh, at the next, and this is what we have uh, of macro charcoal for uh, the later uh, for the upper uh, Pennsylvania. Please, the next is just thank you. Sorry that. I wasn't fast enough. And this is our working group. And thank you for your attention. All right, thank, thank you, Andre. A very interesting talk. Are there questions, uh, comments? I, I Okay, I'll, I have a comment. Um, it sounds like there hasn't been much of an effort I mean, I know I'm very familiar with the Mesozoic effort to look for charcoal. And it's largely because of arguments about low oxygen after the Permo-Triassic boundary. As you know, some people, Peter Ward, Retallick, argued that oxygen was so low after the Permo-Triassic extinction that we have no charcoal. I'm my picture up um, there. In, um, but it looks like in the later uh, Paleozoic, there's been very little effort to look for charcoal. Uh, maybe... Uh, Portland, somebody comment on that? I mean, it's good that you're looking for it in Brazil. It sounds like there's very little known. Yeah. Anybody want to comment on that? Yeah, no, that, that was a good talk. Um, you know, I, I've always been perplexed. We, we know that Gondwana coals, which are principally Permian in age, um, have much more inert night in them. You know, in, in a typical, uh, you know, the coals that I was showing, like the Springfield, Heron, you know, on a full seam, uh, full channel type basis, we may be getting 12 to 15 percent inertinite. And I know that some of my colleagues, um, South Africa, especially some of those coals, you know, they're routine, routinely 40 and 50 percent inertinite. And so there's something fundamentally different. Uh, we know that the flora is is different, but is it? You know, I guess the question I would have is, is it just the flora? I, I suspect it's not, but what is causing, you know, so much of, why, why do we get such, such an increased proportion of charcoal generation in Gondwana relative 
to you know the the coal basins in, in the northern hemisphere, current northern uh, northern hemisphere. Should I should I comment it? Comment it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, it is uh, the the Nertin, the Gondo and the Nertinites. Uh, these are also a big, uh, huge discussion because uh, because of the high levels, uh, it was argued by Taylor and uh, other authors that uh, the Nertinites of Gondwana they uh, orig originated from other forms without, uh, uh, which is not fire. Uh, so. Uh, for a long time, uh, we didn't look for charcoal in our coals or in our coal bearing stra strata. Uh, so uh, after, after 2005, 2006, we started to increase our effort to find charcoal in Gondwana. And then we started to find charcoal everywhere. Uh, so perhaps, but it's just uh, uh, something I, if I can suggest something, uh, perhaps you can have a look for charcoal in all the Pennsylvania uh, uh, levels you have, or also for in the in the Pennsylvania coals or the clastic uh, sediments. No, we, we've we we we've looked for it. I mean, but the, the the amount of petrography on on our coals is is extensive. And it, it's just a, it, it's a it's it's a black and white thing. I mean, we we have inert night, and it you know, I, regardless of whether you, you think it's fire, biodegradation, or a combination, it doesn't matter. I'm just just from a strictly amount comparison. You know, we we have so, just so proportionally much less than what you find in Gondwana, and you know, uh, it's always in the literature. It's always well, it's a different flora. It's cooler. It's um, got a lot of gymnosperms, which are resinous plants. Well, we had a lot of pteridosperms, which were also resinous, but yet we're not, you know. So it 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 um, it, I'm, it I'm, I I don't have an answer to the question. Herman does, though. Yeah, I think it's the rain. The area around the equator uh, during the Carboniferous had very high rainfall. The inertinite layers are concentrated in specific layers, which actually uh, the cold splits there. And those were times when there was fire. So these were dry years that occurred at certain times. And uh, yeah. Jonathan Wilson has a comment, a question, please. Thanks, Spencer. Okay, there you are. Yeah, hi, hi, Andre. Uh, great, great talk. Uh, I just have a quick question. Um, I, I was wondering if you're able to identify using wood anatomy which plants are burning, and if you are, are they the same that you see in the uh, late Pennsylvanian as you do in the Permian, or is there a change in the plants that are burning as you cross that boundary? Yes, it is possible, but so far we just identified. Okay, we identified a few conifer woods, uh, and. Also, in that general view, we identified, identified ag Agatoxylum. Uh, and the speed we have uh, uh, this uh, subarborescent lycophytes growing in the macroflora, uh, we, we, just, we found just one or two, yeah, two, two uh, localities where we had uh, uh, lycophyte barks uh, preserved as charcoal. Uh, uh, so we are uh, probably, uh, it has something to do with uh, intensity of fire because it consumes all these plants uh, because they don't have wood. Uh, but, uh, and so what we have preserved are the gymnosperm groups. Uh, so, but it's, it's possible if, if you have enough uh, uh, anatomical uh, details preserved and, and it is really possible, yes. Okay, well, um, we still have other comments, questions, but we'll have to save them till after, after uh, let, let's save them till the last discussion period.